Our scripture reading from today comes from 2 Timothy 1, verses 3 through 14. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did. And I remember you constantly in my prayers day and night. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and self-discipline. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearance of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason, I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust. And I am sure that he is able to guard until that day when I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. After me. All right. So instead of looking at Timothy and any text from Timothy as a foundation for a youth Sunday, I want us to look at it more as a church family conversation. And a little bit of that starts with kind of why Paul was writing and how he writes and what his meaning is, what's his focus. Remember that when Paul writes, 99.9% .9 of the people he's relating to are not of the way. They've not heard about Jesus yet. They're Gentiles who are not even in the Jewish community yet, or they're within the Jewish community and people that Paul is inviting into the Jesus community. They call it the way. It's conversion language throughout, except here in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, we get a little different perspective than anywhere else in Paul's writings. We get his grandmother, Lois, his mother, Eunice, and we suddenly discover that Timothy is a second generation or third generation Christian. He's the first person we get to at least hear about who's being raised in the faith, not being converted to the faith. Now also remember, Paul thought that Jesus was coming back next week. Paul talked about not worrying about even getting married unless you just can't control your affections for each other and then go ahead and get married and live in that relationship but his focus was really on the immediacy of the gospel jesus is coming back very very soon we're all going to be here for it so go ahead and get ready and don't worry about what's coming up but by the fact that most of you have a long-term savings plan that some of you have vacations for a year from now kind of thought out and planned that you're making plans for christmas with family we clearly moved on from that, right? We buy insurance for our lives. <laughs> we have a different worldview, a different mindset on our faith than Paul did. 
and those who were coming to the faith around Paul. It matters because Paul was in a sense of immediacy of right now in everything he wrote, and an assumption that everyone was new. When you ask someone, have you been saved? There's an assumption that there was a period of your life when you weren't, right? There's a period of your life, there's an assumption that you weren't yet part of the community. And a lot of that language, even of the modern church, comes out of Paul's writings of immediacy and an assumption of conversion. But what about those who were raised in the faith? What about those who were born into Christian community? And if you weren't born into a Christian family, what about those who were raised in a community that always had talked about God and Jesus around them? Where the Good Samaritan, people thought of it as a children's story rather than Holy Scripture. In a community where you can go to a public store and buy a Noah's Ark mobile for your baby crib. A place where the faith story has always been present. It's not as much a conversion as it is a deepening of faith. Finding your own path, your own relationship with God. It's very different than the way Paul is writing. And to see examples of it, we really have to go back to the Old Testament. Look to Abraham and Sarah and how they passed this family heirloom of faith on to Isaac. And how Isaac passes that on to Jacob and Esau. And we get the stories in scripture of Jacob passing that on to his children. All 12 plus. We get to see Hannah living in faith and that faith coming out in her child Samuel. We get to read stories from scrolls and rituals that are passed down from generation to generation. We read about how the exile impacted those communities trying to pass on the faith and how they struggled when many of those traditions were cut short. A generational faith passed down like a family heirloom. Passed down like an heirloom. It's still important today. Search Institute has been doing research on children and youth for a long time. And even back in the 90s and their most recent research all echoes some of the same findings. Originally, they framed, framed it as assets. It wasn't things that people had to have, but they looked at highly successful people and they tracked back what they all had in common. And they called them assets. Their original list was 40. And one of the things on that list of 40 assets was five adult mentors. People who had five adults in their lives who were not related to them at birth. Five adults, and the more you had, the stronger chance you had, the better it was for you. Five adults who knew you, that you knew, you were in relationship with. And as I look at the role of the church, I think that's one of our biggest jobs. It's one of our primary roles is playing matchmaker for generations, connecting people from one age with people of another, helping them share their stories, reminding us how much we need each other. I had been here probably about a year when a light bulb went on in my head and it wasn't much something I discovered as I finally listened. We had young adults who were visiting the church and I asked a couple of them about how often we would see them. I knew they were transient young adults. They would bounce around. I didn't expect to see them every week. And I said, I know there's not a lot of other young adults here. And they stopped me and they said, you don't understand. We have lots of friends. We know how to make friends. What we don't have is grandparents that support us. What we don't have is parents who affirm who we are by our identity. They were looking for mentors and they didn't even know it. But when they found it, they were in love with it. As one of our friends has told me, there should be a slogan of the church that says, come to Covina Community Church, everybody gets a Filipino grandmother. Or an abuela, or a new uncle to care about you. A new friend who looks different, who comes from a different background who's seen things in their life you've not seen. A place where generational faith is passed down like a family heirloom. 
In the earliest church in Timothy's life, home is where the center of faith truly dwelt. Home is where people would share scripture stories, share prayers, have ritual meals together. Church, church is where faith was expressed. Home is where it was taught and practiced. Church is where you went to give God thanks for what you had received. Think about that. You go to church to give thanks for what you received, not to get something. It's different. It's different than the American experience we have created. Somewhere along the line, all of this shifted. Church became a place to receive. To receive forgiveness, to receive inspiration, to receive their weekly reprimand. Dad, gone at all of you. Anybody was waiting on your weekly reprimand, that was it. Some came to receive communion. Some came to receive the member benefits, the program they signed their children up for, the lunch group that they were now eligible to attend with. Somewhere along the line, the world changed along with the church. The world got faster, more competitive. It got high expectations for everything. We also got a better understanding of developmental needs, human psychology, demographics and marketing, more money in the economy, and somewhere along the line, the church changed to meet it. What was once a family heirloom became a product. Somehow faith became a product. And church was not a place to express our faith, but a place to go and get our religion for the week, to receive it. People raised their expectations of what that church would look like, too. It wasn't that you just went and received it. You had to receive it in style. And the church responded. Ministers became more entertaining. Clergy even became TV personalities in the 80s and 90s. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker and Benny Hinn and Joel Olstein found their rise to prominence. Church became the God Mart. Church became the God Mart. Come stock up on Jesus for the week. And then come back when you've run out. Come get what you need, then go home and hope you've gotten enough. And if you haven't, there's something wrong with you. So come back the next week and we'll fix you again. It became a narcotic, almost, that we got people hooked on. That heirloom, that generational faith that had been handed down relationally, was now in a vending machine for easy consumption. And it's not a wonder, then, that when people don't get what they need out of church, when they show up and it doesn't fulfill their needs, when the program doesn't fit, when the message doesn't fit, when they're not receiving what they wanted to receive, they bang on the machine and scream and shout, waiting for what they need to drop. Today, we face a challenge of re-establishing a family tree, a generational faith, empowering parents to be faith leaders in their homes, empowering individuals to build their relationship with God, not through the church, but through the Holy Spirit. We are not a requirement for anyone's faith journey. We are a community of people celebrating each other's lives together. But anyone who thinks they have to come here in order to get their Jesus is not understanding how empowered God has already made them, how much God is already reaching out to them and loving them. And that falls on us as a church. We have allowed this commodity-based faith to exist for so long, instead of remembering that faith does not come from a church program, it doesn't come from a curriculum, it doesn't come from anything pre-packaged. It comes from an experience of God in creation, in community, in family, and in our own hearts. We can't explain all the ways that God works and reaches people, but we know that you can't package it, market it, and sell it as if we possess it. No, it's something we have to share, to pass on, to participate in, as others are experiencing it. 
We have to rebuild this family tree where we've passed down faith. We have to empower grandparents to be elders and mentors for the children among us. We have to empower young adults to be the bridge between younger and older, pulling us together and being common ground. We have to empower our children and youth to ask questions and to dream dreams and to dream our future for us. And we have to teach them to share their faith. Church is not a private practice. Faith is not a private practice. We each have our personal private relationship with God. But when we practice it, when we practice our faith, we bring what has happened at home or in our own hearts or at a camp or on the beach or at work in that moment of decision. We bring those life experiences and we share it and celebrate it together. We have to teach each other to connect with God not just sing about God. We have to teach each other that church is a family and help each take their place among us as leaders, as listeners, as dreamers, and as doers. When we were living in Kentucky, my wife served church in a small community. It was mostly a farm community. And one of the stories that she heard very quickly when she got there was about Miss Birdie and her tomatoes. Miss Birdie had a beautiful tomato garden, and each year she dried out seeds from her tomatoes that she could use to restart the garden the next year. This may be confusing in California where the growing season never ends, but in other places it gets really cold in the winter. So each year you're often starting your garden from scratch. But Miss Birdie had these magic seeds. They produced the greatest tomatoes in the area. And on occasion, on occasion, she would bring a paper towel folded with seeds in it and gift it to someone in the church. That was a big deal. Now you didn't have to wait and hope that she brought some extra tomatoes and left them out at the potluck. Oh no, you could raise your own you could raise your own Miss Birdie tomatoes in your yard. And then Miss Birdie passed away. And one of the things that people grieved is that she would no longer be able to bring them dried seeds. No one else would be receiving the seeds from Miss Birdie. And it's a very sweet sentiment, isn't it? But think about it for a moment. How many of them had already received the seeds? What were they doing with their seeds? She had already given a gift to the family. All that was required was for them to share what they had received, to pass it on. Church is not just a place to receive. Church is where we practice what we have experienced. It's also where we come to bring our experiences to each other for healing, for support, for affirmation, for challenge, to be a family, to practice our faith in public, in family, in community. What was once a family heirloom was trapped in a cultural vending machine. In church, we've got to take it out. We have to take it out, we have to share it, we have to claim it, and we have to give it away. We have to listen to others and receive the pieces of that faith that we might have lost along the way so that we can all together pass on what we have inherited, a generational faith. We have to live it, we have to share it, we have to pass it on. Amen.